um, I said I'm really uh, honored to be here today to have um, this session. I think um, this is one um, part of capacity development that really, you know, is in line with my passion and my dream, right? So go think about um, seven to 10 years ago, uh, I came across a research that says that um, uh, a lot of young people who are being churned out of the university are largely unemployable. And this this idea, because uh, I kept asking myself, why would somebody spend three to five years um, in the university and then they come out and employers don't see them fit enough to be employed? And right, so I went in a little bit deeper to, you know, look for what are the skill gap? What are the issues that employers are facing? And over time, I've been able to, you know, uh, immerse myself in this area and help a lot of people to be well prepared for the workplace and um, also to be able to position themselves properly um, to be employable by employers, right? So today I'm going to be, you know, just going over some of the things I've come across uh, over time in the industry. And I hope that um, uh, it's going to benefit a whole lot of us here. All right, so thank you very much uh, for having me, Ruth and um, um, Dr. Kenny. So can I proceed? Can I share my screen? Yes, I think you should just be able to share your screen. Thanks so much, Ephraim. One second, please let me quickly load this. In the meantime, somebody that is raising your hands, if you don't mind, since Ephraim still has to talk, maybe you can type your questions in the meantime. You can type your questions, yeah. So um, I think my screen right now, um, please let me know if you can see my screen and uh, I'll proceed. Yeah. Yeah. All right, then. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, let me get to it. All right, so today I'm going to be speaking on um, crafting compelling CVs and profiles. Um, if there is any question, please kindly, you know, um, just put them in the question box and I'll be sure to respond when I see them. All right, so a little bit about myself. I'm Ephraim Dafiago. And uh, I'm a senior product manager. I'm into tech by uh, by profession, and um, I help uh, people turn ideas to market leading products. And I also transform businesses with adaptable digital solutions to save time, cost, and resources. Uh, my belief is that uh, life is a lively process of becoming. Hence, what you think is possible is a function of what you know per time. Right. So that's just a little quote that I usually use to uh, encourage myself to keep on learning and uh, keep on being relevant in the in the current times that we are in. All right, so let's get to, to it. Right. Um, did you know that um, as reported by Glassdoor, each corporate job offer attracts approximately 250 resumes, yet only four to six candidates will be called for an interview. And of course, only one will get the job, right? Of course, this is to let you know that there is so much competition, it's a fierce competition out there. So how do you ensure that you relevant so that you could be one that one person who you know gets that job right i'm going to go right into it um, unlock your opportunities the power of a compelling professional profile first of all having compelling professional profile is crucial in today's competitive job markets and of course here are the reasons first is first impression counts recruiters would often make quick judgments and a strong profile can immediately convey professionalism and education of course, a well-structured profile or resume can make a positive lasting impression within moments. Another important reason is career development. Keeping a detailed up-to-date profile can help you track your own career development and goals. It also serves as an evolving record of your professional life and achievements. Another reason is confidence and clarity. Crafting a compelling profile requires self-reflection and clarity about your career path and aspirations. This process can increase your confidence and ensure you are ready to articulate your professional value in interview and discussions. Another reason is visibility in ATS. So what is ATS? Applicant tracking system. An applicant tracking system it will, it is um, a software solution that most Fortune 500 companies use to sift and streamline all applicants for a job. Right, and um, once your application, or should I say your resume and your cover letter, do not contain some specific keywords which they have put into the applicant tracking system. It will interest you to know that 
your resume and your application is not even going to cross the applicant tracking system. And of course, it means that that will go into the trash, right? And of course, another reason uh, is professional storytelling. Before listing skills and experience, a compelling profile tells a cohesive story of your career. This narrative can differentiate you from other candidates, providing a clearer picture of your unique strengths and career trajectory. Moving on to some of the reasons why it is important for you to have a compelling professional profile is global reach and opportunities, social proof, networking, and personal branding. Speaking of personal branding, which is where I want to actually start from today, but because before we get to um, how to com com uh, put a compelling um, profile, we need to have to speak to this. Personal branding. What is personal branding? In today's digital age, personal brand is just like corporations manage their brand, professionals must strategically manage their own reputation. So what is personal branding? It is the practice of making people and their careers as brand. You need to market yourself as an individual, as a brand. It's an ongoing process of developing and maintaining a reputation and impression for an individual, group, or an organization. Of course, it's not just about being known for your expertise but being known for being you. And why does this matter? It matters, one, because of differentiation. In a competitive job market as we are right now, a strong personal brand can create differentiation, setting you apart from others in your field. Another reason for it is visibility, right? And the last one is trust. So what are the key components of a strong personal brand? I'll give an example of this. I'm sure we must have all um, um, seen or heard uh, Mr. Vusi. He's a very big mentor of mine, right? I listen to him all the time. And once we hear him, once we see him anywhere, we know what that connotes. We know what comes to our mind. That is an example of somebody who has built a very strong personal brand. And what are the components of a strong personal brand? Is the authenticity, the consistency, the specialization, and the visibility. So, now, having talked about personal branding, it will interest you to know that according to LinkedIn's 2021 data, 95% of recruiters use LinkedIn regularly to source new candidates. This highlights the platform's critical role in your job search strategy. So a little bit of LinkedIn, I'm sure we all know about LinkedIn, I will have a LinkedIn account, whether um, it is optimized or not, I'm very sure that we do all have it. But LinkedIn boasts of over 700 million people worldwide. This, of course, demonstrates the extensive network and potential for connectivity. Despite its large user base, nearly 36% of LinkedIn users aren't active on a monthly basis. Of course, this is suggesting the missed opportunities for networking and, of course, professional development. Right. So now let's start with LinkedIn, mastering LinkedIn and starting out. Um, right here on my screen, you can see two profiles, one to my left and another to my right. If you were hiring for a role and you have different applications from different candidates and you see both of them, their LinkedIn profiles, and you go through their LinkedIn profiles and you see this, which of these two profiles are you going to automatically pay more attention to? Mind you, these two candidates are offering the same services. That into the same space. One is a film and TV producer, a director, a cinematographer. Another is a, is a cinematographer. So they're both in the same space. But of course, one looks a lot more enticing and a lot more catching. And automatically, you as a recruiter, you're going to spend more time trying to review that candidate with a more compelling LinkedIn profile. And that is the essence why you need to have a great first impression. Now we're going to go into the different components that make up LinkedIn and so as to ensure that you get an all-star rating on your LinkedIn profile so that you can, of course, personally brand yourself and become a lot more visible to potential recruiters. Right, so we'll start with the profile photo and the banner. So it's important to know that LinkedIn is not like every other social media platform. LinkedIn, although it's a social media platform, but it's for professionals. And of course, it means that your identity, your brand, everything is supposed to be strictly professional. LinkedIn is not Instagram where you put up family pictures and picnic pictures. LinkedIn is not Twitter or Pinterest or TikTok. And of course, with that, it means that you need to have a professional photo 
that is crisp, clear, and represents who you are. If it is possible that you go to a studio, take a very clean headshot in a professional way and upload for your profile photo. An example of what is not allowed on LinkedIn are these two by my file left, which you can see that these are not ideal. Ideally, when looking at your profile photo on LinkedIn, I'm supposed to see your face without any part of your face being cut out. It's that simple as that. If anything other than this is what's on your LinkedIn profile, then of course it means that you need to optimize it. And of course, the next thing is that a lot of us do not have a banner, right? Just like you can see from this uh, second applicant here, they do not have a banner. A banner is very important, right? Um, you may be asking, okay, how do I get a banner? Or why is it important? Or why do I, how, how am I going to go about getting a banner? A banner speaks to what you do, right? Before anything else. If you're a cinematographer, have a customized banner, let people know in one sentence or in two sentences what you do. With that is going to, of course, corroborate authenticity and of course, expertise. Now, moving on. Another thing we need to speak to when creating a, a stand LinkedIn profile is the powerful headline. Mind you, your headline, which is the line of text right under your name, is prime real estate. It's one of the first things people see on your profile. You should make it count, right? Think of your heading, your headline as, as a movie trailer for your professional story. Of course, it should be compelling, it should be concise, and leave people wanting to know more, right? I see a lot of headlines, right? And uh, people do not take attention, put attention to actually putting in what they do. They end up telling stories, writing too much sentences there. Actually, your headline is supposed to contain keywords. What are keywords? Keywords are those strategic words that represent what you do or what you are offering. If anybody is going to search for anything on LinkedIn, they are either going to use two things or three things rather, either your name or your profession or your role. Right. And when people query LinkedIn for that, and if you do not have anything as pertaining to this three, which I have listed on your headline, it means you are not going to be visible. And of course, you would have missed out on useful opportunities. So you need to optimize your headline with powerful keywords. Of course, recruiters offer you specific keywords to find potential candidates. You need to ensure these keywords are integrated organically throughout your profile. So you reflect on the skills and experiences valued in your field and incorporate the stems in your headline. Take, for example, I'm a product manager, I'm into tech, and I'm into product marketing. In as much as I do a lot more of other things, in as much as I'm involved in other parts of businesses, right, I want to be recognized and be seen as a product manager. And of course, when you go to my profile, the first thing you're going to see is Ephraim, product marketer, product manager, right, before any other thing. Now, I've put those keywords there because it's easier for me to be seen like that. And when people come on my platform or when people are looking for product managers within West Africa or Accra or Nigeria, I'm easily identifiable. And that is the power of a good headline. Next, we have the featured posts and the about me section. So the about me section is where you are not allowed to tell your story. The about me session, think of it as that 60 second speech, that elevator pitch. That is the about me section. About me section is where you highlight your skills, where you highlight um, um, why why you should become why you should become um, that candidate that should be sought after. Why you should be the one to to be contacted for this particular opening. If I have a pain point, why should you be the one I will reach out to? This is where you spell it out in the about me section. Take, for example, look at this about me section. As an accomplished entrepreneur and business leader, I embody the unwavering drive and success and passion for success that propels organizations forward. With years of experience, I possess a comprehensive understanding of all aspects of business formation. My visionary approach to brand communications and product management, combined with my exceptional marketing skills and natural ability to motivate teams, has enabled me to achieve outstanding success. I'm a relentless go-getter who believes in the power of planning, scheduling, mobilizing, and executing with unwavering determination. Now, it's very important that you put this 
appropriately because um, research from talent work suggests that applicants are eight times more likely to get hired when they have you know a good about section so how is your about section and mind you just like we've said in the headline right um your about section should also include powerful keywords that reflect who you are or what you do right you cannot be um a product manager and your about section is not talking about product management so you need to ensure that the keywords are evenly dispersed or distributed across every platform or every area or sections of your LinkedIn profile. Now, moving on, the next thing is the featured post. The featured post is that part just below your names and everything, right? This is where you need to put all the things you have done. If you happen to have been featured or you've written articles or, or you've been featured in the dailies or in the media or you've been on the podcast, this is where you put them. It is very relevant because when people, um, be it potential employers or probably other networks, come to your profile, they will need to see credibility. They will need to know that you as a product manager or whatever career path you've chosen, you are, um, as a consultant, you're an expert in that field. And of course, you, you have written or you are into or are actively involved in that space. Now, when people do this, right, um, in their mind, they begin to perceive you as a thought leader. And of course, it means that it's easy for them to connect with you and have a striking conversation pertaining to what you offer. So how do you set up your work experience? A lot of people on LinkedIn just list out their work experience um, in bullet points. I'm here to tell you today that that would not fetch you the kind of job you're looking for, right? Your LinkedIn, of course, is not your CV, but it is your brand. And of course, you need to treat it as such. And what do I mean as it being your brand? Think of it like a portfolio, right? Um, if you're an artist or a graphic designer and um, you're being employed or you're going through a series of interviews, the first thing they're gonna ask you after your CV is, can we see your portfolio? Right. The portfolio is where you outline the credible things that you've done, the achievement that you've made. It's also very important to know that while listing your work experiences, you can also put those achievements in that place. So look at an example of this um, personal branding videographer at Alpha Visuals. Right. In 2008, I founded my first business production company, Alpha Visuals, which focuses on providing elite video marketing and video production services. We have experiences in helping all kinds of companies from small businesses to Silicon Valley companies, right? So uh, a work experience like this would be a lot more catching because it tells into details that you're just not uh, um, a passerby in that, in that company, but it lists details of the things that you're doing and the value that you're providing or the accomplishment that you have made in that organization. Now, another important aspect of this work experience when creating your work experience or when listening to your work experience, it's very important that you add media. We are in the social media age whereby people want to see. Seeing is believing. People, apart from the things you write, apart from the things that you come online to say that you can do, they want to see an evidence of those things. And that is why you are able to do this on LinkedIn when listing your work experiences. It's very imperative that you put in visuals, right? So if you've been at a company conference, where you were speaking, or you've been uh, uh, probably at another event, take for example, you're a product manager or a product marketer rather, and you've been at uh, another event where you are representing your company or the product that you're launching, those pictures, those media, add them to your work experience when listing your work experience. Having listed the accomplishment you made in that experience, in that job, it's also important that you list and upload those media. Of course, this will of course um, give you a lot more authenticity and a lot more visibility. And of course, it's going to help, of course, um, help your personal brand as a thought leader and as an expert in that field. So when building out your LinkedIn profile, it's very important that you try or strive to attain an all-star rating. This will corroborate your profile strength. So LinkedIn provides a profile strength meter that gauges the complete completeness of your profile. You should try and aim for all-star status. 
which requires, of course, the profile photo, industry and location, a current position with a description, two past positions, education, skills, and at least 50 connections. Speaking of connections, I've dedicated some time in my presentation to tell you how you can strategically and intentionally grow your connections on LinkedIn. We'll get to that. So it's very important that um, while creating out your LinkedIn profile, try and achieve an all-star rating because having an all-star rating will let you to be a lot more visible. Should people query um, uh, LinkedIn for your area of description or your job specification, you are likely to appear first or among the first um, um, records before any other person who do not have an all-star rating. So for you to have an all-star rating, of course, you need a profile photo, industry and location, a current position with a description, two past positions, education, skills, and at least 50 connections. So like I said earlier, LinkedIn is not your CV. It is your brand. Think of it this way. It will be how people perceive you, right? Uh, just to you know, add a little bit of humor to this, right? Look at Jon Snow. We know Game of Thrones, right? 30 years old king, fights for protecting his people, single, not in a relationship, live at the palace with his sister. No, these are not the kind of things that we want to see on LinkedIn, right? You could leave all that to probably Facebook or um, what's it called? Any other social media platform. But I would actually advise that you keep it... Um, Keep it same across all platforms because do not forget you are a brand. You may not be a Nestle, you may not be a Coca-Cola, but you are a brand. And if you understand that, you will know that you need to maintain that uniformity across all platforms where you are. Right. So LinkedIn is not just TV, it's your brand, and you need to treat it as such. And keeping that in mind, you need to know that you are and a solution to set or a recruiter come on LinkedIn to search for a particular job role or a particular candidate for a job an opening, right? You need to be able to position yourself as the answer, right? So you need to identify the buyer persona and pain points. Having that in mind, take for example, I will always use a product manager because I mean it's very relatable for me, right? So I'm a product manager. Right. What are people looking out for? People are looking out to churning good market ready products, but they are having issues trying to aggregate all the components or do all the research and everything. Now, looking at my profile, I've been able to identify that this problem really exists. And I've been able to position myself in the sense that looking through my profile, you're going to see all the relevant keywords. You're going to see me speaking to different aspects of product management. You're going to see me speaking to all the other components and stakeholders involved in product management. You're going to see me speaking to product life cycle and, um, and stakeholder management, as well as um, every other components of product management. Now, with that doing, I'm intentionally positioning myself as the answer to whoever or any recruiter out there searching for the product manager. And that is the power of LinkedIn. Putting that into consideration, you need to ensure that you strive to achieve something as good or as better than this when building your LinkedIn profile. This is my personal profile, right? Speaking of banners, banners may not necessarily mean that um, you must put a direct picture of yourself. It's good, you could have another professional shoot where you have your picture, and of course, the things you do or the things that speak to you it could probably be a quote that you resonate with or the services that you're offering or the industry you're into. But here is mine. I'm a creative person and I'm in the tech space. This is my profile. When people are searching for product managers, product marketers, or scrum masters, I will easily pop up. And just to let you know that this year alone, I've gotten about five offers I did not apply. They just came into my DM through email and they reached out to me that, oh, we've gone through your profile. Uh, there's an opening in Accra and uh, I don't know if you'll be interested. If you're interested, let me know and I'll push you the details. That is the power of a good, compelling LinkedIn profile. While others will be out there sourcing for job openings to easily apply, a good LinkedIn profile will attract recruiters to you. All right. So another thing you need to know uh, about, about LinkedIn is you need to have a customized URL. So LinkedIn gives you the option to 
customize your URL. Of course, you know that once you create a LinkedIn profile, right, it's going to come with linkedin.com forward slash those extra numbers and figures and letters. That's what's going to make up your unique URL. And now that is not, it's not good enough. Think of it this way, personal branding, right? If you need to tell somebody your LinkedIn, if you need to submit an application and they ask you to, in the form, they ask you to put your LinkedIn profile. It means you're going to go and copy LinkedIn.com forward slash those many numbers and those many digits. It will not be easy for you to remember. But if you have a custom URL, which you can easily do on your profile, it's very easy to know at any point in time that forward slash DOE frame, that is my LinkedIn profile and anybody can easily find you. And it's also very important that when doing that, right, it's important that you put your name and avoid numbers or nicknames. Put your name. You could put, um, if that is no longer available because, of course, your name, so many other persons have your name, right? But make it custom, make it unique, but still make it very professional. What I simply did here was to add my first name and my middle name initials with my name. And that is my simple LinkedIn profile. And I can easily remember this anywhere. So it's very important that you also, you know, have a custom LinkedIn URL. So moving on, mastering LinkedIn and standing, and standing out. Now we'll go into networking. In here, I'm going to um, delve a little bit deeper on how to intentionally grow your LinkedIn network and um, how LinkedIn naturally works, right? So um, connections, of course, can broaden your exposure and potential job opportunities. Of course, you need to connect with your colleagues, your classmates, um, professionals in your industry. Of course, don't just connect. You also need to engage, right? You need to share content. You need to comment on posts and participate in discussions, right? So, um I'm going to go through how to do all this in detail, how to be intentional to grow your network on LinkedIn. How does LinkedIn work? LinkedIn work on a metric system, right? Whereby uh, the first, your direct connections are your first degree connections. This is an example up here. Here you are, and every other person who you've connected with directly, they are your first degree connections. And every other person who is the connection to those, your first degree connections, the second degree connections. Any person who is the direct connection to those second degree connections are your third degree connections. And of course, you know what they say um, when they said um, that opportunity or your next big break is um, is a call away or a friend away, right? Basically, that is how it is on LinkedIn because LinkedIn works on a metric system. You need to understand that the more first degree connections you have, the more the third degree connections you have. So if you only have 50 connections, you're only going to have 1.25, 1.2 million third degree connections, right? So let me explain a little bit for that. When building your LinkedIn profile or when, should I say, when you are trying to grow your LinkedIn network, you should aim to spend 10 minutes a day growing your network. At least 10 minutes a day. The more first connections you have, the more second and third connections you will have. If you want a new job, don't just rely on friends or family. And I'm going to tell you why. There's something called the power or the strength of weak ties. So according to one of the most influential theories in social science, you are more likely to nab a new position through your weak ties, which of course are your loose acquaintances, with whom you have very few mutual connections. And why is that so? What gives strangers this edge over our friends. Why is this so? Because close connections, which are people in your circle, they largely have the same facts and professional options at their disposal. But people who belong to different communities can offer a, a whole new set of information and helpful connections. A mutual friend can act as a bridge, connecting the job hunter. What I just said recently, that your next big break or your next opportunity may be a friend away. So a mutual friend may be the bridge, connecting the job hunter, to a contact in a different group, which provides new opportunities. So if you want to grow your network on LinkedIn, be very intentional. So LinkedIn goes just beyond connecting with people who you know regularly. You will need to connect with people who are experts in your industry, people who you look up to or you admire, people who you would like to you know, read from or hear their thoughts on particular issues. 
areas that you're interested in, look for experts in those areas and connect with them. If you want to be specific to your industry, look for experts in those in that your industry and connect to them. If you're looking forward to getting a job in a company, right, look for prominent people, gatekeepers or influencers or key decision makers in that particular company. And those are the people you should look forward to connecting with. Now, let me give you another tip. In as much as the first connections you have, the first, the, the most first degree connections you have, the most second and third connections you will have, it's very imperative that, think of it this way. If you have your first degree connections as solid quality people, industry experts, captains of industry, imagine the kind of connections that those people are going to have. Automatically, those connections will become your secondary connections. And of course, that will mean the kind of content that pops up on your timeline for you to read. The kind of things, the kind of conversation you're going to see on your own profile. It all depends on the, the caliber of the first degree connections that you make. All right, so moving on. How do we grow our LinkedIn? Still on that, still on expanding our network on LinkedIn. It's very important that we do not take this for granted. Join groups. No man is an island. You cannot grow yourself um, all by yourself. You need to be very much involved. You need to be aware. You need to participate. So what does that mean? Join groups that are relevant to you. Join groups that you are interested in. Join groups that are pertaining to your industry. Join groups that are pertaining to your field. Join groups that are interested that are pertaining to the courses that you support or the volunteering activities that you're involved with. Join those groups. When you join them, you will see a lot more people who you'll be able to have direct connections with. You will see conversations that are going on in those groups. And it's just it is just not just enough to, to join those groups. You need to participate because you need to be visible. If you're dosa, you won't be visible. When people make comments or make a post on those groups, comment, tag them. Let them see your comments. Have an opinion. Always have an opinion. Have an opinion and have a very insightful opinion that can spark more conversations. In that way, you become a lot more noticeable. Right? So, moving on. The advanced search feature. So, LinkedIn have one of the most robust advanced search feature. Of course, not in comparison with Google, but when it comes to the professional network setting. Right? Using the advanced net advanced search feature can actually help you to get access to anybody anywhere. With the advanced search feature, you are able to tailor your searches to a particular industry, particular location, and even particular role. And you will be able to see all the people that fit into the specific criteria which you have outlined in the advanced search feature. And you'll be able to do valuable connections with them, send them requests. And if they are in your first degree or out of your league or in private mode, do not just send a request. Attach a message to those requests. Say you look at uh, probably you see uh, the, the, the chairman of the World Bank and you would like to, to connect. Of course, someone like that starts when he sees his connection request, he's going to probably look and like, do I know this person? This person acquaintance, do I know them? And that will determine whether they're going to accept or not. But if you send a personalized message with it, of course, you've increased the chances that you are going to get accepted. And of course, being first degree connection with that kind of person, of course, will open you doors to other great potential employers or business partners. So whatever it is you're looking for, uh, be it um, a job opening, be it um, a particular individual, a particular role, or even as much as content, right? You can search for it. If you're looking for conversation as pertaining to a particular industry, if you're looking for a uh, conversation as particular, as particular to um, a unique role, search for it. So LinkedIn search is not just only for network. You can find useful content. If you need to know um, who is LinkedIn top voice on a particular topic, search for that topic, search for that area, and they are going to pop up. And once you see them as LinkedIn top voice, because you're going to see the icon next to them, always ensure that you read whatever it is they've written and have a, an opinion on it. Have an insightful opinion. Make a comment. Possible, make a repost with your opinion on it. It's as simple as that. 
So how do we become a lot more intentional, right? Uh, in nurturing our connection. Now I'm going to take you through a process that will help you to be very intentional and strategic in making connections, not just connections, but people who, after making those connections, you can have probably an informational interview or a coffee with them sometime and catch up and build long, long life, meaningful professional connections, even outside LinkedIn. So, so the goal of this is to be, to create and build relevant connections on LinkedIn. How do you go about it? Now, we've spoken about branding, we've spoken about um, the necessary things to put into your LinkedIn profile in order for it to be compelling. Now, how do you become intentional in growing your network? You do not just go and send connections to everybody. There's a high chance that not everybody's going to accept. Some people have a criteria for accepting their connections. But how do you stay top of mind for those people? How do you stay relevant? How do you become noticed, right? So that by the time you put in that send request, connection request, it will be accepted. You have to be intentional about it. It's not magic. And you have to be strategic. Now let's go. The day one, you may do this from day one or you may skip this from day one. But I would advise that you skip this. Don't just go right ahead and connect. First, you like content. You go through the profile. You see what they've written. You've seen what they're about. Like the content. Like the content as much as you can. Like the content. Go on to the next stage, you comment. Of course, when you're commenting, you comment in line with what they have written, right? And of course, like I said, have an opinion. Let it be smart. Let it be insightful, right? Let it be engaging. The next thing you do, you share their content. And when you share their content, add your own insights to it. Share and add your own opinion to it. They are going, definitely going to see that you've done that, right? And of course, you follow them for the last three weeks four weeks and you've actively engaged in all that content you are becoming top of mind because every time they go through the linkedin and they see that notification they are seeing that if they made a comment if they reposted if they like this if they that and of course you become top of mind what, what do you do next you endorse what does endorsement mean endorsement could mean something like oh i've gone through xyz profile for a lot of time now Speaking on this topic, I think they are an expert in this, and I really recommend anybody who is interested in learning more about XYZ to follow this person because you're not going to regret doing so. That's an endorsement. You've done this, you've become top of mind. You've become a lot more relevant before that person. You can go ahead and send that connection. And I bet you, you'll be considered for that connection because they're going to want to accept. And if potentially that's somebody you look forward to working with, or probably uh, somebody that you look forward to working in their industry or in their company. After sending the connection request, right, keep on building the momentum and then invite them for an informational interview. What is an informational interview? Of course, informational interview is not to ask them for a job. Probably uh, a 30 minutes break uh, where you guys just catch up. If you're in the same city, you catch up. Uh, if you're outside uh, different cities, you could set up a call just like we're doing right now and just get to know um, what the work is all about how the daily work is in the other environment. I mean, get to know about he was able to build up his portfolio or his profile to be there and all that. And you get solid information. And you go as far as asking, oh, when, 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 when is the next hiring time and all that? And uh, you'll be looking forward to But do not ask them for a job. You just want to get to know more about the company and about their process. After doing this, should you see an opening in that company? Because most companies usually have the referral system whereby if somebody refers you, you come top of mind in the sense that your application will be reviewed first before those people who were not referred by internal staffs. And you see that, you turn in your application, you ask the person for a recommendation. And it's as simple as that. You come top of mind and you're firstly considered. It's interesting to know that most jobs are gotten through recommendation. And of course, I'll end this with this, the law of reciprocity. The law of reciprocity basically says that when someone does something nice for you, you will have a deep-rooted psychological urge to do something nice in return. As a matter of fact, you may even reciprocate with a gesture far more generous than the original good deed, right? Of course, this corroborates what I've been trying to say of being intentional about your connection and being strategic with the process of connection. Imagine after done all those things over a couple of months, the person will have that deep-rooted urge to want to accept your connection request, also accept your invitation for an informational 
into you. All right. So let's move on to other interesting aspects, which is pertaining to your CV. So did you know that on an average, recruiters spend just seven seconds reviewing an individual CV? 98% of Fortune 500 companies utilize ATS, which I spoke about in the beginning, which is applicant tracking system to filter through resumes, emphasizing the crucial role of keywords, optimization, and formatting in CVs. Right. So beyond just putting keywords and all that, you need to have a CV, right, that is compelling in the sense that um, you are able to tell your story, professional story, accordingly, so that it is interesting. Beyond just qualifications and work experience, the cohesiveness and compelling narration of one's professional journey can significantly impact a candidate's appeal to recruiters. So, understanding CVs and resumes, the basics, what are the difference? Um, a lot of people have always asked, oh, what is the difference between a CV and a resume? Are they not the same thing? Basically, they are the same thing with just a few exceptions. A CV or curriculum vitae, typically a lengthy document, encompasses a person's complete academic and professional history. Of course, this is more particular to you know, um, the European system, right? However, a resume is a concise record of pertinent skills, education, and experiences aligned with the job you are applying for. We'll get into a lot more details about this. Now, what is the key difference? The resume is highly customizable and should be tailored for each application. In contrast, a CV is a comprehensive, a constant overview. Types of CVs, tailoring your approach. We have three fundamental types of CVs or resumes as may be. We have um, the chronological, the functional, and the combined or hybrid CV. Moving forward, let's discuss the types of CV. The chronological CV is ideal if you have a solid work history without significant gaps. It lists your experience in reverse chronological order, placing your most recent position first. Prioritize work history, listing jobs in reverse chronological order. It is best for individual with strong work trajectory and no significant employment gaps. However, in contrast, a functional or skill-based CV shines a spotlight on your skills, making it perfect for those looking to change careers or re-enter the workspace. Of course, it highlights skills and abilities over chronological work history. It's ideal for changing fields, re-entering the workforce, or with varied work history. Right. And of course, lastly, the last type of CV is um, the hybrid or the combined CV, which offers the best of both worlds, as the name implies, showcasing both your robust skills and impressive work history. The key here is to choose the format that best, of course, highlights your strengths and suits your career paths. The hybrid CV integrates both skills and experiences in a cohesive narrative. Of course, it's suitable for professionals with extensive skills and work history to showcase. How do you now structure your CV? Did you know that from research from Resume Lab found that 30% of hiring managers will disqualify resume if it's longer than I bet you didn't know that. But of course, it emphasizes the importance of preciseness in your resume writing. Right. So when writing your resume or your CV, of course, it's a format that best showcases your experience and skills. If you're not in academia, if you're in the creative industry or any other industry, of course, I would advise you to go with a hybrid or combined CV so as to show the plethora of experiences that you've gathered over time. All right. So you need to choose a format that best showcases your experiences and skills. Of course, chronological order is most common, right? But a or combined approach might suit a career, a early career person or a career changer better. So always include essential components, but customize the section based on your background and target position. What do I mean by this? You cannot have a one size fits all for every application you see. You need to be able to tailor every CV or every application to your CV and vice versa. If you see a role, 
and you have skills in it, you have experience in it, you cannot use a chronological CV that I've just put a history of everything you've done and just put into that position. You need to have a sit down. According to the job description and the requirements of that particular opening, you need to tailor your CV in accordance to what has been there so that you can apply. And when doing so, you need to use strong action verbs and quantify your achievements wherever possible to show you added value in previous roles. It's not just enough to list your work experiences and say, I did X, Y, Z, I did X, Y, Z. Every recruiter, not as much as every employer out there, are looking forward to people who can bring immense value. They're looking forward to team members who can think on their feet, who can take initiative. And above all, they're looking for people who are go-getters and doers. So it is just not enough to show that you worked here. It's also very imperative and helps you project your brand better if you're able to tell that, oh, I achieved X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z by raising this X, Y, Z, X, Y, by X, Y, Z percent. Right? If you're a customer service agent, I, 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 I help to reduce conflict resolution time by 15% within the space of six months by drafting out a new conflict resolution strategy for the company. That shows data, it shows action, and it shows that you are a doer. So you need to be able to use strong action verbs and quantify the achievements you have been able to make in your previous role. Okay. All right, so crafting for the market. The Europe versus America, what is the difference? So European CV is just like I've said, curriculum vitae are comprehensive, including personal details, often allowing a standardized format like the Europe has. And of course, the American resume, concise, focused, avoiding personal details, tailored to the position. Now, when building your CV or when applying for that role, wherever you are in the surface of the earth, there are things that you must know. You need to know your audience. If you're in Europe, you cannot use American standard style of resume to apply for a role. You need to be able to tailor your CV to that environment. So you need to know your audience. Of course, different European job markets have unique expectations. Of course, for instance, in Germany, employer might prefer a CV that includes a photo and personal details. Of course, while in UK, employer might not. You also need to be very careful of the industry expectations because industry expectations vary. Of course, in IT professionals might need to emphasize different skills and experiences than those in finance. And of course, across all platforms or across any type of uh, application or any type of CV, you need to be able to highlight your educational background appropriately, making the BSc, the MSc, or the MBA a focal point if it's a requirement in your target job. And put into consideration as well is the cultural nuances right so put into consideration the cultural nuances because they can also impact cv and resume expectations you need to know the standard of the country you are applying in the cultural etiquettes and the professional etiquettes and of course if you speak multiple languages it's very important that you are able to also highlight that in your cv of course it's a significant aspect in europe's multilingual job markets now how do you navigate european market expectation so crafting a CV for the European market requires a balance of detail and clarity. It is not just your career summary, but a detailed narrative of a professional journey, unlike in the US, including personal information like a photo or marital status is common in many European countries. However, always search the specific norms of the country, like I've said earlier before, and the expectations. In Europe, ideally, a three-page CV may be accepted, right? But standard for US is a two-page CV. So in as much as you're putting all the work experiences that you've had, you want to let the employer know that you've been everywhere. Try and limit those experiences or those information to just two pages. And that will be succinct a lot. Because if um, an applicant, uh, a recruiter have to go through um, 250 applications just to fill up a particular role. That has to let you know how much time they're going to spend on your CV. And just like I said earlier on, from research, 
the average recruiter has spent seven seconds, just seven seconds on your CV. How do you intend to capture them and wow them in seven seconds of looking at your CV? Do not forget that most of the biggest decisions of your life will be made in places, in the rooms where you are not available. It's your brand that will speak for you. It's your achievements that will speak for you. Or in some other cases, it's somebody else that will speak for you. So it's very important that you take into consideration all these nuances. Do's and don'ts of crafting distinguished and effective proverbs. Right, so I've said this before, I just want to reiterate it. Uh, when building your CV, use action verbs, quantify achievements, maintain consistent formatting, and customize for each application. However, don't use an unprofessional email. I've seen this countless times um, where people are applying for a role, and of course, we have their email having, um, take for example, Olalekon XYZ for real at yahoo.com. If you used to have that as your very first email, moving on to the professional setting, you may need to create a new email that have just your names in a more professional setting. In that way, I spoke about personal branding. In that way, it corroborates the strength of your brand and shows how professional that you are. And of course, I need to also let you know that when you're applying for a role and they've put up a, a separate application portal, right? Ensure that the name of your CV title is your name. I've received a lot of application. I've gone through a lot of application whereby uh, I see that the candidate is actually very good. And when we are about to make a decision or move to the next stage of application, I cannot find their CVs. Why? Because they probably saved the document as my CV or my resume. And how do I know that John Smith, his CV, he's titled my resume. So if you're John Smith, you need to title your document, which is your CV, as John Smith's CV, John Smith's resume. Right? And tailor it to a particular role. Or you could say John Smith's business development resume. And it's as simple as that. The same thing for your cover letter. Let's move on real quick. All right, so examples of compelling CVs and resumes. Now, this is a more a better visual representation of what we've been speaking about so far. So as we put into consideration everything we've been talking about and how to be a lot more meticulous and intentional about having a good CV that represents your brand. First, what can you see with these two examples? The very first glaring thing here is the font. The fonts, don't use a cursive font when writing your CV. Structure, it's very important that you know where you are applying and the nuances of that uh, environment. You need to structure your CV accordingly, right? And of course, when listing your achievement, I said earlier on, use strong verbs, strong quantifying words that quantify your achievements. I'm going to read out this very first CV and you will see what is written there so you could contrast with the other cv achievements finish my college studies of course you did finish your college studies what did you achieve while there currently working as an it support assistant education 1991 to 1992 and all that just like that english this will not even make it through the applicant tracking system even though you may just be getting into the workforce for the very first time and you may ask okay i'm just new into the workforce i've never really had um a professional or corporate work experience how do i tell on my cv it's still very important that you follow the standard and you follow the structure and look at this second cv and see the clear difference there is a statement of purpose or profile statement or in some other ways an abstract an abstract simply tells what your goal is, what you're capable of. In a nutshell, like I said, in, uh, when we're talking about LinkedIn profile, the about section, right? If that's this, this is the second elevator pitch. When I read this, I want to know the value that you are bringing to the table. If you are 
just get into the workforce, right? When I read this profile statements, you should tell me what you're capable of and what your interest is and the value that you can add to our organization. Look at an example of this. A motivated, adaptable, and, re and responsible computing graduate seeking a position in an IT position which will utilize the professional and technical skills developed through past work experiences in this field. I have methodical, customer-focused approach to work and a strong drive to see things through to completion. Right. So in this much detail, I've been able to get to know uh, who David Gibbons is and what his drives are. And if I'm interested, I can go a lot more further and look at his achievements. This is an example of a good CV. Look at this CV in contrast with the other one. Look at the positioning of the education. When listening at your education, right, educational uh, background, it's also good that everything is well formatted. Take, for example, the year, what you started, your school, they're written in bold letters, not block letters, bold, right? And of course, um, you may want to include um, your your, 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 when you go to graduate with, if you're first class, second class, or graduate summa cum laude, you may want to include that there as well. And of course, include relevant activities you got involved in or relevant um, uh, clubs that you were involved in while at school and the relevant things you achieved, right? If you represented your school or your faculty and uh, you received some scholarship or you were given some award, it's so important that you can list it there, right? But the format, the formatting should be very neat. Same thing too when listening at your employment, history or experience, the year, the position, the company should be bold. And of course, um, what you did should be listed in bullet points with strong verb and quantifying action words. So we'll move on. Another example of a good and a bad CV. Right. Of course, do not forget proper formatting, highlighting your skills, and then formatting your work experience as well as your educational background adequately to meet with the requirements of the job or the position that you're applying for. In this first CV, there is a summary. There's the work experience. There are skills, there are educations, but it's still not up to standard. Why is that? The summary is vague, does not include what um, would actually project this candidate to the best of their abilities. The work experience is more of like a job description rather than their achievements in their role. And looking at the listing of the work experience as well, does not include the start dates and the end dates, no vital information. And the informations, they are not cohesive. The second work experience puts a date to it. And the current work experience does not have a beginning date. So it's important that you put out all these details. Your CV, like I said, it's, it's like your past, right? And like I said earlier, most of the decisions that will be made about you, most of the biggest things that will happen to you, they'll be made in rooms where you are not present to defend yourself. It's the reason why you need to put your best foot forward. All right. So I'll give you an example of a compelling CV. These are two separate CVs, but they are both equally good. One is for a management consultant and another is for a communication specialist. And you could see the outlay of these two CVs. There is the summary highlighting. I'll start from the second one, Jonathan Wright, strategic communication specialist, email location, right? Summary, a very good, succinct summary that highlights the best of their abilities and their interests. And of course, the strengths, highlighting the strengths to let the recruiter know that, oh, these are my strengths. And uh, before anything else, I can provide you with this. I'm very good at this. I'm very good at crisis communication, strategic storytelling, and uh, media relations. Then I go right ahead and list 
the achievable things I made in my current role or in my previous role before I put in my educational qualifications, uh, interests, languages, and all that. In some months, if the CV makes it through the applicant tracking system, which I bet it would, because the relevant keywords have been placed sparsely evenly across every aspect of the cv the summary the work experience and even the strength of the keywords relating to a computation specialist evenly across the cv definitely it's going to make it through the applicant tracking system and when a reviewer or a reviewer finally sees this in seven seconds they're able to see the value that jonathan wright will be bringing to the organization and be able to determine if they're a good fit and we'll go ahead to schedule an interview with Jonathan Wright, same as the other um, CV to the left. So, did you know that Job Vice Recruiter Nation report states that 42% of recruiters consider cover letters the second most important factor when reviewing a job application? But to surprise that many applicants still neglect to include one. Why is that? A cover letter is as important as the CV or the resume. Even if it's not stated in the job description or stated in the application process, a cover letter would go right ahead to tell a story before you are there, to tell your story, to speak for you before you are there. It's very important that you need to include a cover letter with every single application, even when it is not categorically stated in the application process please include a cover letter because a cover letter will help you tell your story, your professional story and your journey. It will help buy the, the recruiter into your story, like attract them into your story before they even get to meet you and to spark interest. Should your story be compelling enough, it will open the door for the interview for you. Before you write a cover letter, it's also very important that you put into consideration every single nitty gritty. Like I said earlier, in as much as we do not have a one size fits all CV or resume to every single thing, it's the same way we do not have a one size fits all cover letter. When writing your cover letter, research the company and address your letter to the hiring manager. If possible, show that you understand the company's challenges. As a matter of fact, it is very it's important that you do this. Show that you understand the company's challenges and demonstrate how you can help address them. Just like I said when we're speaking on um, the LinkedIn profiling, you need to be able to understand the pain points of the recruiter and you position yourself as the answer, as the solution. So in as much as you've seen that role, that opening, and you're interested in applying to that opening, why should you be the one that would consider for that opening? If you do not understand why they are filling up that role, what the pain points are, what they're trying to achieve, how do you then position yourself to be a better fit for it? Is That's the reason why you need to research everything and know what the problem or the value of that role or the uniqueness that that role is going to help the company achieve, the goal is going to help the company achieve. And position yourself as the answer. So your, co your cover letter will help you to do that. Your unique value proposition should answer the question, why should we hire you? And this should be reflected in the cover letter. You need to end your cover letter with a call to action, such as requesting an interview or stating that you will follow up. Right. So having come to this and discussed this, um, another thing to note is when doing all this, building your professional portfolio, um, having a compelling profile, LinkedIn profile, and, and um, you know, building up your CV. It's also very important that you regularly update your CV or resume with your new skills. Because like I said earlier in the beginning, that life is a lively process of becoming, right? We are not who we were yesterday. So if you've taken a new course, right, you've gotten a new certification, gotten a new achievement, a new award, Go back to your CV, update it with relevant skills, relevant qualification, 
relevant, relevant experiences. And at all times, probably uh, depending on the frequency or whatever time you choose, have an outsider, like a professional, to give you feedback on your resume. Um, two months ago, two months ago, a friend reached out to me that, oh, they are being interviewed for a management position, right? It looks like it's going to come through, but I should help review the CV in respect to the job description. And I did. The CV was quite okay, but where was my input most valuable was using verbs and actioning or quantifying their achievements in the previous role. So where he listed out his duties, I helped reward and rearrange that action, that aspect to where he was able to achieve XYZ. So I achieved this and did this by XYZ percent. I did this by XYZ percent. I managed a portfolio of $7 million and did this and did that. It shows a lot more of value. So you always need to have, um, seek a professional advice and get professional feedback, right? Some of the times we as individuals, we tend to downplay our achievements. Some of the times we even do not know some of the things that we have achieved. But if you have a colleague or someone else help you to give you that moment of reflection, right? Check you in. You can see those things that you have omitted, which would have actually helped you to nab in your next job. All right. In closing, when considering a cover letter, always ensure that your cover letter is written in such a way that in such a way that it tells your story effortlessly. Ensure that all the grammars are correct, proper punctuations, proper paragraphs, right? Maintain an active and professional online presence, particularly on platforms like LinkedIn, and let the information on your CV tally with the information on on LinkedIn. We spoke about branding. So it's very imperative that whatever you the CV aligns with what's on your professional online presence, which is LinkedIn. And um, to conclude this workshop, I just want to remind you that uh, your journey doesn't end here. Crafting a compelling CV or a resume is an ongoing process. Of course, it's one that involves as your career goes. And uh, always remember that um, you are way beyond just your skills and your experiences. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ephraim, and of course, you can contact me on LinkedIn at uh, forward slash do Ephraim, and of course, my email Ephraim at foresight.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ephraim. That was really wonderful, brilliant, uh, brilliant speech or and and insights um so in, incredibly helpful i guess this is also what um well and the chat is full of these co kind of comments that people are really um, very much appreciating what you did so um very insightful thank you so maybe if um so everyone so there we've got a lot of questions in the chat um i'm going through these now and address them. Um, but please also feel free if you would like to step into the room quickly in order to have a direct exchange with Ephraim and all of us, of course. So Ephraim, maybe let us start. One question um, is, um, hmm. okay, is it wise to leave out information about gender, country of origin, photo, et cetera, to limit biases at the first impression? So that okay. should go to the CVs. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think that's a very fantastic question. Now, we spoke about um, putting into consideration cultural nuances, right? If you're in Europe, it's imperative that you include that. But in America, it's not so important, mm -hmm. right? So uh, you need to understand the markets where you are in and do according to that market right i know that a lot of people like you said would want to 
exclude those information because of biases. However, you should know the information that would be useful to your employer, right? Uh, you may not want to include if you're married, hoping that's okay. When you get to the interview stage, you can discuss that should they ask you that, right? You may, but it's also very important that you let them know if you're male or female, because they would like to know who they are speaking with, right? And of course, people have a uh, job opening that's specific to um, a particular gender. They may want that this role, we want a lady in that role. Right. So just to clear this ambiguity and to ensure that you do not get disqualified when you're almost at the interview stage, just let it out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What about Africa as a target market? I mean, I suppose that always, yeah, but generally you've been talking about the US and, and the EU, um, the market, but what, what about Africa? All right. So in Africa, Right. Thank you very much, Ruth. Okay, that's true. So in Africa, right. Um, yeah, in Africa, right. Um, putting your picture on a CV is not really necessary, right? But um, ideally, um, your location is fine, not your address, not your exact address. Your location, if you're putting in this role, this role states that it's from Kenya, you need to let them know that, oh, I'm living in Nairobi, Kenya. That's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. You need to put in your vital information, such as your contact details. It's okay. You need to put in if you are male or female. That's okay. But your picture is not necessary. As to whether you're married or not, it's not necessary. Where you hail from, where you hail from, your village information, all that ethnicity, it's not necessary. Date of birth hasn't been mentioned yet. The oh, system. thank you very much. Yes, date of birth. Right. So in some openings, in some openings, it is specifically stated that we want a young person. Of course, so many people have spoken to this fact as being biased and all that, but you cannot really help it. A lot of people want specific gender or specific age grade for a particular role because the nuances of that role is very important. And when you see that in some applications, and you know that um you do not fall within the requirement of that opening. Do not bother. But should you include that in your CV, I would always advise that you do. Right? What You may not include the year you were born, right? But just let them know that you are XYZ old, right? In that way, they can tell if you've had a certain job break, right? If the years of experience or your age does not collaborate with the years of experience, and if they're still interested or you find your skill or your experience very exciting, you may want to discuss for that. You could go ahead and let them know, okay, I had a job break or I had uh, a life-threatening issue or XYZ came up and this was the reason why it spent, I spent XYZ time you know, trying to get to this level. It doesn't do you any harm, right? I mean, right now, recruiters are looking more for what you're bringing to the table. And some of the times they're actually looking forward to more experienced hands, right? So if you can actually show that and you think putting your age there would actually reflect the number of years and experience you've had in the industry, then it's fine. There is no harm in that. Great. Great. Um, we have one question. I mean, it's a bit of a question in itself if if there's a proper answer to that but um, the person raises um, recruitment platforms so um th that require sorry that require um to put in data directly into a predetermined field uh, fields rather than submitting cvs or resumes um and she's asking how can one effectively differentiate themselves in such situations um, right. i think so it's interesting because this is in fact happening very often yeah yes it, it happens it happens very often and uh i don't i don't i see it a lot and i myself i'm always oh if you're asking for me to upload my cv and oh why do you still ask me to fill up all these many details right mm -hmm. so here is one reason why recruiters do this in as much as you are looking for a job right and in as much as there's an opening in our company we need to fill up this role we want to ensure that we get people who are interested in taking working with us as we are very much interested in offering this job out. And what would that signify? If you take a time to fill out those details, it will show that you have higher interest and you're particular and you have actually done your research. 
So in other words, it's going to give you a, more, a lot more leverage, right? To show that you've painstakingly gone through this process. Think of it like, I know it may not always be this stressful or it shouldn't always be this stressful, but think of it like you're applying for a scholarship. You see the rigorous process it takes to get to a scholarship, to get a scholarship, right? Because they're actually trying to ensure that this scholarship benefits the right people and the right people gets it. It's the same approach. We want to fill up the role, but we want to ensure that the people who are genuinely interested in what we are doing and are coming with immense value that gets this role. So if you can, I would advise that don't just um, apply to every role with a single click button. It's not a simple one checkout system. You need to take out time to you know go through every detail and spend some 10 to 15 minutes quality time to apply for that role. Thank you. <clears throat> um, just going further, um, what is spelled out in the chat. So someone just wrote, sometimes some organizations in Africa ask for your languages like mother tongue, proficient languages. I fear that it is indirectly asking your ethnicity, specifically while f um, filling online platforms. How can we manage that? Um, recall in my session just recently, I said yes. that if you are a bilingual and you speak multiple languages, include it. Um, I don't, they are trying to ask about ethnicity. Some roles, some openings, right, benefit if you are able to speak multiple languages, right? Take, for example, we are in West Africa, but in West Africa, we speak English, we speak French, we speak Swahili even, even. Right. And if you're applying to a multinational, it will sell you more, it will give you a lot more credibility and increase your chances if you're able to speak these three languages. So it, it's a multinational role and they're looking for somebody who's able to, you know, converse fluently in this West African market and you're able to speak all these languages. That's a plus for you. So putting in the languages, as a matter of fact, um, we have a lot of Africans who have taken the time to learn Mandarin and German, right? So it's an added advantage to you. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're they're from Germany, but they've learned the language because so as to do business internationally. So another thing you need to know is um, being able to stay relevant globally, right? Because right now we're in it. You know, the world is a village, literally. Right. And of course, you could be in Africa and you're offering services to people in Europe, in America and all parts. Right. If you are a vendor or you are offering services to people in China, you need to be able to speak Mandarin. It will make your communication and your business transaction easier. Right. So I would advise that if you're speaking multiple languages, include it there. Great. Um, one question back to the seven seconds um, recruiters spend on having a look at um, CVs. Um, so in those seven seconds, what are do you think they're looking at or what could be interesting spots uh, to, to focus on? In seven seconds, a recruiter is looking at your um, statements, right? And then of course, achievements in your current rule. I have several seconds. If I read the first two sentences of your statement and then I read the first work experience and I cannot see any quantifiable achievement in the next thing. So recall I spoke about keywords. Keywords are very important. You need to know the keywords that are particular to your particular role and your particular industry. In business, it's like speaking the language of the business. Do you understand? You cannot be a communication expert or um, a, a communication strategist. And you're not talking about public relations, you're not talking about marketing, you're not talking about SEO, right? So being able to use those, should I say, let me just put it in quotes, industry jargons buzzwords industry buzzwords just the keywords right and of course not just throwing them randomly but using them effectively and also quantifying your achievements in your last row so in seven seconds that's what i'm looking at i'm looking at your statements does it include any of that achievement or anything i'm looking at your first row and which is your current row is there, are there any achievement what are the achievements and do we have those keywords there do you know what you're speaking about and we're good to go Right. 
Mm, great. A um, couple of comments or questions around the length of the CVs again. So <clears throat> you you mentioned these three types of CVs, for instance. There's one question, which is the more attra most attractive one. I think you mentioned some uh, some ideas around that already. And generally, the length of a CV, there's even the question if a CV can be only one or should even be one, a one pager. I think maybe that's more the resume again, but yeah, over to you maybe with such, well, with All right. this, basically. Okay, so when when um, writing out your CV, Right, of course, the temptation is there to always list out all your achievements and everything. And of course, you can go overboard and exceed three pages. In that way, it's a resume, it's a CV, right? In that way, it's a CV. But in as much as it is that, ensure that it does not exceed three pages. But if you are in um, America or even in Africa, stick to two pages. Stick to two pages. So what you could do is, if you've had, if you've had years of experience. And in that years of experience, you probably have worked for uh, five companies, right? And you achieved a whole lot in those five companies. Now, the challenge may be, how do I list all that in just two pages, right? I'll make reference to the last CV I shared, whereby I just went straight to the statements, right? And of course, I listed that achievements and then strengths. You see that in that last CV I showed, I displayed, we only have four the first most recent to history, employment history. And that's where I made the focus of listing the achievements in that room, right? Then I could also include after those two, my previous work experiences, but not go in full, full details. So as to also reflect the years of experience, which I claim, right? So I started working early, say at the age of 20, and uh, now I'm, I'm I'm 30, and I need to reflect in my CV that within a space of 10 years, I've worked for five different companies, and I cannot list that five companies in the two-page CV or two-page resume. How do I do it? I can list the very most recent three, listing all my achievables, and then the, my very first two, which are my beginning experience right after school at 20 and the other one and just list them as bullet points but the three most recent i've put in much details in that great thanks very much um one question around linkedin um uh, which oh we know with a good compelling linkedin profile do we necessarily need to subscribe to the linkedin premium that offers more services and access to recruiters <clears throat> No, you don't. Right. Okay, good. <laughs> you, have a CV, you could you could have a compelling LinkedIn profile. Everything that I've mentioned and I've I've spoken about today, you could do all that on the LinkedIn free plan. But but Great. if you have the money to spare, if you do, because I understand that LinkedIn pricing differs uh according to locations, right? If you do, um you can go on the beginner plan or a student plan for LinkedIn. Why? Because uh, speaking about the strength of your first connection, first degree connections, there are some people, I don't know why they do it, but they would connect with people who are verified or who have that LinkedIn badge. So if you think that you need it and you can afford it, go for the student plan so you can have that LinkedIn badge attached to your name. Great. Um, some further questions about the um, CVs or application letters here right now, by the way. So what is the difference between an application letter and a cover letter? Is there a difference? Okay, so uh, ideally it should be a cover letter. I think application letter should be for academic purposes and all that. Yes, so ideally if uh, if in a professional setting it should be a cover letter. It's not an application letter. Application letter probably comes in probably you're applying to the embassy or to um, school and all that. Right. One also quite a detailed questions, but but interesting. Um, is it necessary to list, for example, any scholarships received in the achievement section? All right. So if that scholarship, take for example, you are a young school leaver, right? Uh, you could you could list that under your educational background. Right, of course, uh, it could also corroborate the strengths of your of your application and also show that uh, 
you are authentic and uh, people have taken extra time to you know um certify you as somebody who is worthy right because not everybody just receives the scholarship right and it's also important that if it's scholarship from a big organization you can list it there because it shows the authenticity of what you've done that oh i got a scholarship from xyz right and that's it so if you've gotten a scholarship you can list it under your you know educational background and another um, question around achievements instead of listing your achievements for each position can you summarize the achievements into a sentence for instance in the cv no please mm -hmm. list your achievements in bullet points Good. and rather related to the different job positions than yes. in yes one. Yeah. okay yes right. okay so now i think we should somehow let's see yeah, it gets into very much detail now. Um, is there any motivation letter, statement of pur purpose or cover letter? Is there any difference? I mean, okay. Well, um, I think you relate us to that, right? Motivation letter, cover letter, statement or purpose letter. If, if yeah, there's... I think I just have, I've answered that in the previous question. I mean, there's a different motivation letter is different from, of course, statement of purpose and all that. Yeah. <laughs> On a very technical other side, so we are going, um, the, the, there were some questions. If you make your, your presentation or the, um, the model CVs, et cetera, available. Um, so Kina and I, we are going to, um, make this whole event, um, um, accessible via YouTube. If, if this awesome. is. Uh, one answer to that and of course if then it's otherwise up to you and how far you share what, what you did today, but that's what we are going to do anyway. To everyone. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you, everyone. So I think we are um, at the point now to address what comes next. So Ephraim is going to be available for 30 persons on Monday and on Tuesday um, and um, giving individual feedbacks to CVs and LinkedIn profiles that those persons need to send in advance. So we've been thinking, Kina and I, of course, how do we select these 30 persons? And we thought the most um, fair version is just um, to work on a first come, first serve level. But what we would like to do is now, um, after this um, incredible input, that those persons who would like to submit, they have a bit of time to work on their CVs and their LinkedIn profiles. And, but still, so, um, we are opening up this kind of slot tomorrow between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. We are going to um, send you an email um, address in the chat function now to where you should send the CV and, and the LinkedIn, uh, link. And, um, so the first 30 persons submitting in this time, um, will be in. Latest by midnight tomorrow, you will have the answer or a positive confirmation if you're in or not. So those persons who won't receive any response are unfortunately not part of that group. Um, I, I hope that was quite kind of clear. So uh, which time zone, please? Thank you very much. Um, so it's the South African time zone, which is, uh, let me again, it's GMT2, I think. I'll check that again. So it's four o'clock in South Africa right now, if that helps. That's actually an excellent question. Yeah. So I'm writing. Yeah. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> GMT plus three. Thanks so much for that, really. So um, I'm typing the email address to which you should send um, your CV and, and LinkedIn profile link. And this is then selected and forward to Ephraim and the whole process also of uh, also the time slots then when you are available um, for the persons Ephraim on Monday and Tuesday. That's then coordinated as a next step. Um, and that's basically um, Kina and his his workforce uh, enabling that. Um, so let me let me quickly. So the email address is info at mosipsha.com. So it's in the chat fun function now. So from, again, South African time, 
GMT plus three tomorrow morning, eight, nine a.m. to six p.m. in the evening. Um, please send your um, CV and LinkedIn profile to this email address. And if you are part of this group of 30 persons, you will receive a positive confirmation until the end of tomorrow. I think it's an incredible opportunity, really. Um, I would be thrilled myself. Um, and um, so please make use of this. Oh, sorry. Oh, I got able. Thanks to correct. So it's GMT plus two. Oh, God. Okay. So it's four o'clock in South Africa now. That that should help. GMT plus two. Um, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Is there anything, Ephraim, from your side uh, that you would like to see specifically or something? I think it should be both, right? The CV and, and the LinkedIn profile. Yes, please. Submit. So to make it a lot more easier, um, if you want us to review the um, LinkedIn profile on Monday or Tuesday, please try and incorporate what we've spoken about today so that we could you know, spend um, shorter time so that we could cover a lot more people. Right, try and incorporate what we've learned today. Then, with this as a rubric, we used to check for you know how well you can always optimize or move further from what you already have done. Great, Ephraim, exactly. And this is why we also wanted you to have a bit of time, um, until to submit so that you're not just sending what you've got right now if it's not yet on, on that level because you can actually really. Um, source from Ephraim best if it's already advanced onto a level where you can really engage on what, what has been discussed today. Sure, the question again, the recording will be shared, um, not not right now, this is not possibly, uh, possible techni technically, um, but we are going to connect it to YouTube anyway, so it's going to be available then um, for everyone. Yeah, Kina's just posting the email address again, can we have your presentation at Frame today to work more on our CV and LinkedIn profile. That's really up to you now. Um, I, I don't want to. In, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So it does mean that you could only send from 9 a.m. tomorrow on. Anything that comes in earlier would just not be considered. The idea is really to have such a such an entrance moment for everyone and that at the same time everyone has a bit of time now to work through the documents before sending them. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I can share my slides if they're interested, so I'll forward them to you so you can share with them. That's fantastic. Can't we even upload them here or is this something that you wouldn't like to do? Uh, if it awesome. is, uh, if it is, um, did you work on it on if it's on in on on Canva? We could just actually no, no. say, okay, it's not on Canva. Uh, PowerPoint, Microsoft. So I will need to yeah, just. Uh, should, uh, we don't want to send it to the entire group that registered because some came yesterday. They are not today. You want yeah. to send okay. it actually? Um, so maybe, if, okay. but we can upload. Um, uh, well, for PDFs here, can't we? I think so. In the chat, should be yes, of course. Yeah, and uh, yeah, of course. Is this an option, Ephraim? Or Ephraim, what's yeah, let, let me upload it to Google Drive and share the link. Okay, Perfect. great. Yeah, let me do that right you. Okay, let's keep keep us in the room then for a while until this is uploaded. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you. So. Yeah, great, everyone. So you've just heard it. Ephraim is uploading his slides here in this chat. Yeah, again, some questions around if it's possible to send things earlier. Ugh, unfortunately, not really. It's We've been discussing this upwards and downwards, how we can kind of make this fair and that we also really achieve that people rework what they submit along what Ephraim has just been addressed. So apologies for that. I know that in some cases it's then difficult, but maybe in that case, particularly, maybe you've got someone who can send it then tomorrow after you go through everything today, if you're not able to send it tomorrow. Mm. 
I think this was an incredible session. I'm I'm thrilled. So CV, what format do you prefer? PDF? Ah, that's a good question. Um, Ephraim, what format do you prefer um, when it comes to the CV? Um, PDF or rather um, my word format? Uh, Any we, we could we could do PDF. We could do PDF. And uh, okay. I think that's a good question. Yes, when submitting your CV or applying to job opportunities, your CV should always be in pdf otherwise stated that please up, upload in word documents no, in that idea. way the structure of the formats is not changed if you upload in pdf unless they stated that you should upload in word document please always upload um in pdf yeah i suppose that was also addressed now specifically to you maybe that you do some some comments on yeah. it yes please i think also, I, PDF will be fine. PDF will be fine. Lovely. I can see uh, how happy people are and how much they appreciated what you just shared with all of us, um, Ephraim. Well, you're reading it yourself. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Yeah, fantastic. This has been an exciting journey. Ifran, thank you so much. That was very, very well researched and well presented. Um, um, and of course, very, very insightful. You could see the excitement in the room. The fact that yeah. people say one hour, this program was supposed to end 3, 3 p.m. South African time, but they were willing yeah. to stay more than an hour, means that they were getting <laughs> from it. So thank you so much. That has been an exciting one. And I think it's important for them because many of them are about to enter the career world. So it's important for them that these nuggets are shared. Um, yeah, so guys, by, as I said, by tomorrow, you guys will know the ones that are able to make it to the to the personalized um, review. But even if you don't make it, the good thing is that Ephraim is actually offering to share with you the slides itself. So you can go and actually start engaging it and start um, updating your 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 cv and everything yourself um but also like um ruth said make sure you actually work on your cv um, um linkedin profile based on what you've learned so far so that when Ephraim meets you he will have to upgrade it further you don't want him to now come again and start repeating what he has already told you in that way you don't benefit from from the personalized review that's the point the point is that you've already applied what you've learned by the time you come he will help you refine it better in that way it it makes also sense for you yeah yeah if I'm, do you manage to upload it or is there can can i support somehow maybe i'm trying to do that right now i'm trying to do that just uh, i think um in another two minutes i should be able to do that please. fantastic yeah great yes and please to everyone please get in touch um also via linkedin <laughs> and uh yeah um it was amazing really i mean we of course the, the amount of people who registered in the first place was much or the number was much higher than the number of participants in the end but still i think it, it was such an such an incredibly big group still um joining yesterday and today and um it's it's for for us, Keen and me, who are doing this kind of series now um, of of um, seminars or workshops. It's it's really wonderful to see what is happening there, and there will be more for sure. So we are continuing with this kind of format, and maybe even some other formats more more specialized. So also please reach out if you have certain ideas or wishes. We are going to send out also an evaluation sheet. Um, um, which also encourages you to come back with ideas um, if if you like, Absolutely. and also asking you if you would like to stay in touch and and, um, and if so, that you share your email address um, and some other details. So just in case if you would like to stay in the network and get further information and opportunities through it, of course, including maybe uh, also a more active part. So let's see what comes up next, I guess. 
Yeah, Stella is now yeah. So yeah, Ephraim is uploading his presentation, so there will be the sample CVs as well. Mm. Okay, here's okay, another one. Please repeat the deadline for the submission of the resume. Okay. Um it's it's not only the resume, it's the CV and LinkedIn profile. Well, CV resume and LinkedIn profile. Time to send is 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. South African time. To info at again. Com. Thanks very much. <clears throat> oh, I think my slides are still uploading. I thought it would have been done by now. Mm. Okay, can someone send the CV if he has not a LinkedIn account? Hmm, that's, I, I mean, I wouldn't constrain that, but I would rather encourage also set up quickly a LinkedIn account, at least with some elements, um, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's the best way to benefit from it. Okay, so I think PDF has uploaded it. That's wonderful. There it is. Great. Yeah. So, guys, it's available. You can download it from the chat session. So I've shared it. Right? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Yo, okay. I can't see the link yet. Um, what, what link are you referring to? It's an email address where you should send both. The document. I'm trying sure to refer to the document, the slide. It's a document. It's not a link. Sorry. Ephraim, sorry. Of course, you mentioned it's a link to, yeah. What, yeah. No, it's a document. Okay. It's this document, document just yeah. on top of your, your message. Yeah. Yeah. I was also able to download. Thanks. It's working. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yes. We have to keep for a while until yeah. everyone's able to download it. <laughs> gotcha, sure. Yeah. yeah. 